Thanks. Thank you so much for coming. It's, it's a fantastic... Uh, uh, Professor Clapham, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to moderate this and, and, and for giving me the opportunity to be here. The, uh, the question is, is the, is the European Union still a world leader in human rights? And I'd like to uh, start out by discussing why that is even an important question to ask for, uh, for the European Union, for us in Europe, and then move on to, to address the actual question. Uh, you know, as I've looked at some events in the past few years, I've often wondered, one question popping in my mind has been, what's so scary about smart girls? I mean, why did, why did Boko Haram decide, instead of you know, bombing one more army barracks to, uh, to go and abduct uh, 300 girls from, from a school? Why did terrorists in Pakistan, uh, you know, plant a bullet in Malala Yousafzai's head because she was promoting education? What's so scary about smart, educated girls? The answer to that question is pretty obvious to me. Educated women in any society change entirely the balance of power of that society. And therefore, those who control the power, or who want to control it, don't want to educate them. Now, if you were to take that and extrapolate from it, you will see, you may see, in fact, even a strategy of fighting terrorists. Yes, you need the guns and all those things, of course, in, in some instances, but if you want to fight terrorists, shouldn't you actually be doing what they don't like you to do, which is educate girls and women and boys when they are shooting at cartoonists in Paris, aren't they sending you a message that they truly, truly, truly do not like freedom of religion and belief, and they really don't like freedom of speech? And if you're going to be fighting them, shouldn't you be consistently, no matter who you are, a European, a Chinese, an Egyptian, a Brazilian, shouldn't you be out there promoting, as hard as you can, freedom of religion and belief and freedom of speech? When, uh, when, uh, when ISIS is trying to take over power in Iraq and elsewhere and to basically discredit all government institutions that are in place, doesn't that send you a signal that terrorists want black holes of power where they can then impose their own systems of law? Shouldn't you be, no matter who you are, European or anyone else, building up independent courts, independent institutions non-corrupt governments. Shouldn't you put in an emphasis on that? In many ways, this ties into the first reason why it's extremely important to promote human rights around the world. It is that if you look at any bloody conflict in the world today, whether domestic or cross-border, you will see that a major violation of human rights is most likely at the roots of the conflict or that addressing major human rights challenges is at the roots of resolving the conflict. Human rights is not soft politics. Human rights is not an asterisk in real politic. Human rights is hardcore foreign policy, hardcore war or peace. That's why it's important. The second reason why it's important to us, at least, is because this is a world where increasingly relativism is taking power over well understood international laws and rights principles. Many different countries around the world are beginning to aspire to the dogma of might is right <coughs> because maybe they have more guns than their neighbor. In a world where values are being in danger of being eroded through this cultural, culturally, politically relativistic approach, it is fundamentally important for a world power such as the European Union, a so-called soft power by many, to use as its main weapon international law, international agreements, international order. Human rights is 
at the core of international law. It is international law. And therefore, for us, and for the sake of the world that is in danger of slipping to different power clusters, it is fundamentally important to return us and the world back to that principle. Now, there are many other reasons why human rights are important in a foreign policy, but let me give you those two. Given this, given why we are engaged, and at such a high level today in virtually everything we do, are we a leader? Yes, but not, I submit to you, or we shouldn't want to be a leader in the traditional sense that one understands leadership. In other words, the power that we have, the European Union has, and should exercise, is the power of convening like-minded human rights forces around the world, not the power of flying a Eurofreedom flag all over the world and saying, look at us, we are the human rights champions. And the strategy that we are using, I am using, the high representative is using, um, for those of you who don't know the EU that well, we don't, have a f we don't have a foreign minister in Europe. We have a high representative for foreign and security policy so that no one knows exactly what she does. We have a high representative. We don't have a foreign ministry. We have the European External Action Service, just so you know, OK? Because we just don't want, because we just want to keep it secret, just for us. But I submit to you that the strategy that the EU is following, and I am opening. I'm, I, I hope that there will be debate on this. I mean, there may be people in the room that disagree that this is in fact a strategy we are following or should be following. is based on six fundamental courses of action and principles, which I will call the six E's, just to make them easier to sort of uh, throw up in the discussion. The first principle, the first E, is empowerment. The European Union is focusing all its attention, all its money, all, most of it, all its diplomatic power and gravitas in empowering human rights holders on the ground in different countries, whether those are civil society, whether those are independent institutions such as courts, parliaments, media. And the reason we're doing this is because human rights in the end of the day cannot be imposed on the outside. For it to become firmly ingrained in, a, in the social fabric of any society, it has to become the ownership of the society itself. Those governments around the world today who are attacking civil society, trying to shrink its space, trying to cut off its funding, trying to imprison it because they disagree with what civil society says, and in some instances either killing it or allowing it to be killed by others, including private companies sometimes, those governments are not just violating human rights of those people directly themselves, but they're also ensuring almost that human rights will not be able to take place in their societies for many, many years to come. Because they're trying to kill the ownership, the local ownership of human rights. Empowering human rights is the first E, the first priority. The second E of the strategy is engaging, engagement. The European Union engages extensively with a lot of really difficult countries on human rights. Countries that violate them often, um, countries that sometimes lead the fight to justify their violation around the world. We speak to them, and I do, and in many instances, we are the only ones who have managed to have the access to speak at the highest government level with many of those really difficult governments. The point of that engagement is to try to build a certain modicum of trust, if that is possible, that will allow us and them to address some of those human rights problems more effectively. This is not a small issue engagement. Many times there is an impression, or a demand even, on the European Union, on myself, on others, when egregious human rights violations occur, to simply, publicly point a finger. 
And that, as I will discuss later on, is in fact a very legitimate demand and something that we often engage in. But pointing fingers is something that will not necessarily open the doors or allow you to find the avenues to change a situation on the ground. It could be an element of a strategy, and in fact it certainly is, to raise awareness of a major problem and to push a government one would hope to desire greater engagement. But in and of itself is not enough. We need to engage, and we do engage. Second element of the strategy is engagement. I will avoid mentioning particular countries that I have been in the past few months, although I can't, it's not a secret really, uh, and not all of them are in the same category, you will see, but maybe I'll tell you in the end after I, I find the strategy. Third E in the strategy is enlargement. Enlarging international and bilateral coalitions to promote human rights. That is, in a sense, what I told you at the beginning, wishing to use all our F power and efforts to give ownership of human rights to others, not to keep it just to ourselves. Enlarging coalitions is the reason why I have focused extensively in the past year or two in engaging with regional human rights mechanisms, whether the ASEAN or the African Union, the League of Arab States, or the Organization of, uh, of American States, uh, uh, or the OIC, uh, or others. Many of these human rights institutions are relatively nascent. It is precisely the time that we are willing to discuss with them, to support them in any way that they desire and that we can, to give them the ownership of human rights. Why is that important? It is fundamentally and mostly important to address a second major human rights challenge, the first one, I didn't exactly, I highlighted it, but I didn't tell you it was the first one, is the attack on civil society around the world. We are seeing it increasingly, it's extremely dangerous, and that's why so much of our strategy and energy is based on supporting civil society. The second major challenge to human rights is the attack on the universality of human rights. Increasingly, there are countries around the world that are saying, in a sense, that human rights, yes, 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 the covenants say that they're universal, but they're not really. The argument goes that basically human rights were something that came out of a Western cultural understanding a few decades ago. And that unless other parts of the world reach that same level of understanding, they are not bound by the human rights treaties and by the universality of human rights. This, of course, is a very dangerous attack in addition to being misguided and misleading. Because if it were to take hold, as you can imagine, the whole human rights architecture collapses. If anyone can pick and choose what human rights they apply and when, you don't really have human rights. So it's very important in this effort for the whole world to know that it is not the European Union that says, although it does say, and although it does fund and fight to eliminate female genital mutilation around the world, it is not the European Union that is in the front line saying this, but the Organization of Islamic Conference ministers a year and a half ago had a decision saying that FGM goes against Sharia law. It is much more important and effective when human rights is, through building international coalitions, a flag that everyone is wishes to fly. It wishes to fly. This coalitional building is not always easy. There are, in fact, cultural differences. Anyone who denies that doesn't understand the world. There is a compromise, however, that has been found at the United Nations level in the so-called Vienna Declaration of 21 or 22 years ago. And that says that cultural differences have to be taken into account when we promote human rights. They have to be. We're not all the same. But not in order to justify ignoring some human rights if your culture doesn't like them, but in order to ensure that all human rights can best be implemented in the context of your culture. Fourth E, encouraging human rights changes. 
We encourage human rights changes around the world. We are changing even our rhetoric on human rights, even on the issue of universality. The fact is that the, I, I submit to you the European Union was quite rusty for a while in terms of developing arguments that were persuasive, not to us, but to the rest of the world on universality, on a number of other issues. We are getting better now. And we're encouraging changes and using all our tools and instruments to be able to support governments and to support societies and institutions around the world who wish to promote human rights improvements to do so. Whether it is through incentives in our trade policy, whether it is through redirecting our development aid to be an aid that focuses on human rights, whether it is through instruments with which you fund civil society and governments to, to, to build institutions and make human rights changes. We support these changes. When it comes to torture, we are supporting and building with a number of countries around the world independent institutions that can truly monitor torture when it happens. So that again, it is their ownership, not ours. Just to give you one example. Fifth E, enforce. As much as you encourage human rights and you want to encourage them, there are times that you simply have to try to enforce them because a government doesn't care, because the violations are too gross. The European Union's support to the International Criminal Court is extremely well known to those who follow, unwavering and continuing. And we're trying to also convince other parts of the world or countries who are not as supportive today that they have to become. Accountability for major human rights violations is a sine qua non, not simply morally speaking, to ensure that those who commit the gravest crimes against humanity don't get away with it, but also in order to send a signal that if you do this, you will not be able to escape it. Therefore, to prevent huge violations. And in fact, in my view, it is that element of prevention that maybe needs to be more strongly pushed in terms of a support of the ICC. But it's not just that. The public statements that the European Union makes on human rights, whether it is from the High Representative or from myself or from our delegations on the ground, are hundreds every year on any issue of human rights you can imagine, on tens of different countries and situations. And in many instances, we determine that indeed, Public diplomacy has to be the way that we utilize when we realize that the situation is getting out of hand. Enforcing human rights is the fifth E. And finally, the sixth E of the strategy, embody. The European Union to be effective in human rights, as effective as it can be, it has to embody human rights itself domestically. We have to practice what we preach. And indeed, this is the biggest weapon that we have when we promote human rights around the world. We don't have guns to impose human rights. It is our credibility that does so. Even though many of us, and certainly myself and most of you in this room, given that your students never lived through the Second World War, We were, some of us, taught about it and followed it, but the fact of the matter is most of the young generation in Europe has entirely forgotten, doesn't really know or care how the European Union was created. But guess what? Others haven't. Others who are going through bloody conflicts today, others who are transitioning to democracy, know very well that our soft power, our competitive advantage is precisely the fact that we, a few decades back, were the grossest human rights violator through the Holocaust. That we, through the, throughout the Second World War, killed each other, neighbor killing neighbor. And that we managed, through deciding to build a union based fundamentally on human rights, we managed, in a few decades' time, to be the most peaceful, the most prosperous region of the world, and the most socially 
also, if I should, if I can say so, cohesive. I emphasize the last part to say the following. Many, many people have misperceptions sometimes about the European Union's role, including, let's say, in the international fora. But for me, economic, social, cultural rights and our being vocal on human rights violations are two of the biggest misperceptions that I know. There are people around the world who say to the EU that you only talk about civil political rights. What about the fact that we have no food on the table? What about the fact that we don't have shelter over our heads? What is the EU do doing about this? It's one of the discussions. The other one is, why is the EU not, not vocal enough on human rights? Why are you not pointing fingers more? Both are terribly wrong and terribly misconceived notions, but there you have it. We're just talking with, uh, uh, I see here, Christina Kokinakis, who is from the, uh, from the EU delegation uh, here in, uh, in Geneva, the Human Rights Council. The European Union or EU member states are, if not the only ones, the huge majority of countries at the Human Rights Council who actually sponsor and promote so-called item four resolutions, which are resolutions on particularly egregious country situations at the United Nations. Virtually no one else does. These are very contentious resolutions sometimes because they focus on particular countries. And of course, it is the Human Rights Council absolute prerogative to have, and it does have, that kind of focus as well. The EU is in the front, front lines there. How many people know that? Not that many. You want to talk about the economic social rights element? The EU is about 8% of the world's population. Only. It's about 20% of the world's economy. Only. It is more than 55% of the world's development aid. 8% of the population of the world and 20% of its economy offer more than 55% of the development aid around the world. And what is development aid if not human rights aid extraordinaire? if it builds the schools that girls can go to and they can become empowered and they can become economically independent and politically active. What is development aid if not human rights aid extraordinaire when it builds hospitals around the world or wells for people to drink water out of that they don't have today? We don't call a development aid human rights aid. Maybe that's just the strangest, a strange thing about the EU really. And I, I suppose it's because when we built a social safety nets, when we became the world's leading region of protecting our citizens, we never called that human rights action either. It was more social action or political action, but we never thought of it as human rights. But indeed it is. Providing good health and education to your people, providing social safety nets, providing labor standards that are high, protecting the environment, these are human rights, economic, social, cultural rights. We are leaders in this as well. Let me close by tying in a little bit with what I said at the beginning, which is the cultural relativism debate, the enlarging coalitions part of our strategy. Oh, you want it again, by the way, just in case? Empower, engage, enlarge. Encourage, enforce, embody. <clears throat> Let's think about this argument that human rights are not universal. I hear many governments, or some governments, promote this. I hear individuals who violate human rights promoting this. I never hear victims of human rights promoting this. So let's think about it a little bit. Is human rights really a battle between cultures? Has it ever even been that? Or is it a battle within cultures? I submit to you that it has never been a battle between cultures, human rights. It has always been the universal language of the powerless in any culture, 
in any society, in any political system, in any religion, against the relativism, relativism of the powerful in that same culture, in that same religion, in that same political system. A wife being abused by her husband in Athens or in New York or in Beijing or in Johannesburg or in uh, Brasilia or in Moscow or in uh, anywhere in Saudi Arabia, she will never tell you, oh, you have no right to intervene on my behalf. Stay away because human rights are not universal. Let me be abused. She's the powerless. The husband doing the abusing, the government that refuses to arrest him, they will often tell you, oh, stay away. We have special family values here. You don't understand them. They're the powerful. Human rights has never been a battle between cultures but within them. It's the universal language of the powerless anywhere in the world against the relativism of the powerful. And I think that once that is understood, and once the cultural relativism argument collapses, we're in a much better position to then get our heads together and work together, as the EU wants to do, convening well-meaning human rights powers around the world to start making a real difference. So thank you very much for this opportunity, and I'm sure that we'll have a, a, a good discussion. Thank you. No, thank you very much. That was a very refreshing uh, take on the role of the EU, but also on human rights more generally um, in the 21st century. Um, I'm standing up so that I can see everybody, not because I'm going to give a long speech. Don't worry. Um, all right, while you're thinking of uh, your questions, I, I will maybe take the chance to ask the first question because um, I was very taken by what you said about engagement, which uh, is a, an idea now that's working at multiple levels in, in human rights. And I was also taken by the fact that the human rights violators that you started the talk with were Boko Haram. And I suppose my question is, is there room for the EU, or for you in your role, to engage with Boko Haram about why they have this attitude towards intelligent women, as you put it? Um, or is that still a sort of a no-no area that we can't engage with these groups because these groups are beyond the pale or terrorist and so on? And engagement is still only the engagement between permanent representatives and ambassadors at the Human Rights Council, and somehow we, we, we won't engage with them. That would be my question. Well, I, I think it's an excellent one, and, and of course a very tough one to answer. No, I mean, I, you know, I, I haven't focused on engaging with them personally, let me say. Uh, we, we, of course, uh, and in all these negotiations that are happening around the world in addition to the fighting, um, uh, have had the opportunity to have a certain degree of engagement. But if you take, if you take uh, Boko Haram or ISIS, you will see that, especially ISIS, um, you're talking about a very deeply ingrained and a very different way of thinking of the world that, uh, that you can discuss about, but your, your, your chances or opportunities to make inroads there are probably quite slim. However, trying to fight uh, violent radicalization uh, in our societies as well, there are thousands of Europeans who have traveled uh, to fight with ISIS, uh, is something that I think rightfully so the international human rights communi community is increasingly working on. So trying to find a way to address the issue, to bring back to the forefront the issue of what it means to, what it really means to have freedom of religion and belief. Why it really is a way to develop prosperous, sustainable societies as opposed to uh, not. Uh, it's something that, uh, that we are in increasingly discussing. We are also discussing, by the way, uh, which is not exactly your question, uh, with the number of governments who are fighting terrorism today on the importance of doing so while respecting human rights themselves, which is almost the flip side of the coin. And uh, the argument that I'm increasingly using uh, and, uh, and uh, I'd love to brainstorm with you about this, is, is one that... It, it, I, I'm trying to change the rhetoric on, on security because, of course, the discussion is, look, we, we really have to fight these people. Our people have the right to security. That's a human rights as well, and a right to life. And therefore, we'll use every, every means possible to do it. And my answer is, yes, okay, but you know what? A few years back, we're talking about development. And then we started talking about sustainable development. And suddenly, today, we only talk about sustainable development. 
we realized at some point that development itself, without a sustainable element to it, was almost guaranteed in the medium and long term to turn on its head, to become a Frankenstein that eats us up. So why is it that we're not beginning to discuss today the notion of sustainable security, which is quite different from security itself, in that, of course, security is what we're looking for. But I would look in intelligent enough to make sure they're sustainable. There are countries around the world who say they want to fight terrorism. And what do they do? They arrest hundreds, if not thousands, of believers in a particular religion that terrorists are using as a cover for their attacks. In, many ca in all cases, religion is being used as an excuse. There's not a particular religion that is a terrorist religion, of course. But you know, we don't, we, we don't like them, or they don't like them, so they arrest them, throw them in jail. They feel safer initially. We, we got out of the way, you know, thousands of this or that. Really? Are you safer? I mean, do you have any evidence these people were actually engaged in terrorism? Because if you don't, all you're doing is you're radicalizing. You're guaranteed to radicalize people who are not radical today. And you will, in the end, bring out to the world thousands of people who then will most clearly, out of frustration, radicalization, want to pick weapons against you. So is it, in fact, an appropriate strategy to create security, to throw human rights defenders or citizens that you simply disagree with in jail? And the answer is no, because you don't have sustainable security there. So this is another thing we're trying to bring in. No, thank you. I think that, that does actually answer it in that if you engage with those who are tackling the terrorists in a sense of you are creating the next round of terrorists or the next round of radicalization, then that is part of the engagement. Um, but now I've managed to stimulate uh, a few people. I saw two hands at the back and one here and one there, and then maybe you might respond. So the, the man in, in the red uh, jumper there, maybe someone. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you've got the microphone already. Thank you. Uh, and thank you very much for reminding us that the relativity bag is a very dangerous place. And I'm very glad that you have reminded us of that. I think the question I had is that how much of the human rights aid, and maybe we should start calling it human rights aid as well as development aid, um, is geared towards communication and media. This is fundamental. Yesterday, I was watching the uh, Oscars, and two people, Leonardo DiCaprio came up with the idea of saving our planet, fundamental. And the other person was Charmin Obed Chinoy, who won an Oscar on a documentary relating to honor killings. And there has been an immediate reaction in terms of the federal government of Pakistan coming out with a new law against violence against women and honor killings. So the point I'm making is that communications is fundamental, I think. And to what extent is the EU providing aid and is working with media people in these countries? Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you want to take two or three questions uh, together? Could you just, sorry, uh, I should have said before, could you just identify yourself so that everyone knows? Oh, uh, my name is Zafar Shaheed. I used to work with the ILO in the past. Thank you very much. And uh, the lady next to you had a, um, sorry, t to your left. Yes, now I can see you. Uh, my name is Michael Sam, my PhD student here at the Graduate Institute. Uh, my question comes from the point of embodied. <laughs> uh, you are right there that uh, for you to advocate human rights, you have to start uh, using them domestically. Now the question is, what happens if you are the one who starts to abuse them, and that being the case indirectly? What happens there? Are you talking about, you can be polite. <laughs> what, 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 are you, what do you have in mind? Is it the, the immigration issue in Europe or? Okay. So yes, I think. 
Um, and then there was a lady in the balcony here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Marie Lodgelic, I'm a visiting fellow here in the Institute and Graduate Institute. I have two questions. One is uh, you told us a bit about the peculiar and singular legitimacy of the EU with respect to human rights, and, and really I buy that story, uh, even though I was not born during the war, but I think it's an important one. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about what is the specific voice of the EU in the broad concert of discussions about human rights? Because you didn't tell us much about this. The other question I have is the question that you brought at the end about, um, you know, the, the powerless have, uh, using and, and kind of uh, uh, seizing, in a sense, this universal language of human rights, not the powerful. But I'm not completely convinced by that, because the example you gave about the woman being beaten up by, by her husband in different parts of the world, well, in some context, the woman will actually uh, buy the, you know, uh, language that actually this is a peculiar culture and this is how it's being done here. So, you know, can you tell us a bit more about that? Because I see that as more a, a kind of normative claim, which I think I would want to share, but I'm not sure that it's really what's happening on the ground all the time. Thank you. And then we'll just take a last question here before uh, we give the chance to the speaker to respond. Thank you. Carol Frampton, I'm Director of Operations for Justice Rapid Response, and we are um, a multi-stakeholder initiative that trains and deploys experts to support accountability processes around the world. I have two questions. One is, you talk about the, um, the erosion of the universality of, of human rights, and yet we also observe a, another kind of phenomenon, that um, there's a, a huge expectation that has been created on what human rights are and can deliver, and that as you pointed out, it is a certain legal framework, and that as a result of these sometimes um, uh, overly <laughs> uh, hopeful uh, expectations, you create situations on the ground where people improvise themselves as investigators, possibly putting themselves at risk and those that they're um, interviewing, and then when those disappoint when those expectations are not met, it kind of undermines even um, more drastically their faith in a human rights system um, and 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 the whole um, architecture. Uh, the second is not a question is more a point. I, I really thank you for that um, concept of sustainable justice. and um, we've sort of been arguing um, about the the importance of funding. Um, accountability efforts through development funds and, and making the link between impunity and the, the very high number of uh, recurring conflicts. Uh, and so if you're really looking at sustainable development, you must look at um, impunity. But uh, I really like the, the term sustainable justice. So if, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. The, the, the first question, the answer is yes, uh, but not as much as we should be, uh, focusing on um, media and popular media. Um, we do support and have supported and will continue to support um, um, civil society actors, uh, that includes uh, um, uh, directors of, of, uh, of, of movies or documentaries or others on an ad hoc basis. But we are, have begun a process of thinking more uh, extensively on how we can use again our convening European Union power to bring together people from many different countries and cultures um, who are engaged in the, in the mass popular culture uh, outlets, whether it is movies or TV shows or others. Um, I mean, in a sense, to, uh, to begin having a, an exchange of best practices uh, between them. Uh, when I was in uh, Pakistan uh, a, a week, a year ago, on an official visit, I asked to meet with um, a number of actors, actresses, and, and uh, producers of television uh, shows, uh, soap operas, uh, to discuss with them the issue of violence against women in the country, which is, of course, a huge problem, a huge issue, although the laws are very, very good, because the problem is that 
it is extremely difficult to reach the mentality, especially if you're outside of the major cities, uh, of many people. And so I thought, shouldn't I be talking to people who do reach, certainly much more than I do, or the EU does, uh, people on the ground? And how are they thinking? How are they portraying the issue of violence against women in those shows? So this is the kind of thing we'll be working more on. Uh, death penalty, I remember as, uh, as um, a couple of decades ago, <coughs> uh, when, I was, uh, when I was in the States, the, uh, the great power that a movie that had come out uh, called The Thin Blue Line had in changing a lot of Americans' understanding of the death penalty. Uh, if you haven't watched the movie, I think it's pretty good even today to try to, to find it. It's called The Thin Blue Line. It really is a documentary, but it's not just a documentary slash movie, so it's very interesting done, where, where the director actually finds in a, in, in a particular case of a particular man who has gone through the whole American system uh, with uh, lazy prosecutors, uh, maybe uh, 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 some of them corrupt, uh, incompetent lawyers, uh, judges influenced very much by you know, small town politics, uh, how a person who eventually is proven without, beyond any doubt was not guilty actually was convicted to death. And the release of that movie was the reason why this person was eventually released, although he was on death row and about to be executed. I think that is an example of what you're saying in a sense. I mean, focusing sometimes on, on cultural uh, media can make a huge difference. So thank you for bringing this uh, to, the, to the front. Is anyone perfect in human rights to go to the second question? Does the, does the EU have problems as well? Absolutely. And if there is, or if there was a time when we were walking around the world, maybe sometimes inadvertently giving the impression that we are perfect, um, shame on us. We're not. No one is. Now, saying that no one is perfect is not to say that therefore everyone is equally imperfect which is what you get sometimes in the international debate. So, you know, I'll go on, a, on an official visit somewhere and someone will say, well, what about the asylum seekers? Yes, it's an absolutely huge problem. Of course, it's not a problem created by Europe itself. It's not, you don't have millions of people trying to leave Europe because Europe is repressing them. They're trying to come to Europe because they see Europe as a, as a heaven of protection. At the same time, there are human rights obligations towards asylum seekers that, the, that many in Europe today have a challenge uh, meeting uh, in, the, in, in the full sense of the, of, of the word. So, of course, it's there. So, no one is perfect in human rights. Doesn't mean everyone is equally imperfect. The question for me, if you like, the key question there is the following Do you have in place, in your country, the minimum institutions that would guarantee that you cannot shove your human rights imperfections under the carpet? Do you have an independent press? Do you have independent civil society with which you may very legitimately disagree or find very annoying, but you do not term uh, foreign agents traitors to their country and throw them in jail or shut them down just because you don't like what they say? Do you have a court system that is independent from any particular political power and imposes accountability on the police, for example, when it violates rights? Do you have independent ombudspeople, national human rights institutions? Do you have a free internet? Basic things. What I often tell people I talk about around the world with is, I'm glad to talk about EU human rights uh, defaults. But after we do this, can we sit down and look at whether or not you have in place, like we try to, those minimum things that force us, force us daily to be perfect, even though we're not, because we cannot ignore the human rights violations in the EU? Can we put them in place in your country too, so that you too are forced to face your imperfections? And I think this is the challenge that we, that, that we have here. Now, I'm not sure that I understood your question uh, about what, in a broader sense, the EU voice in all these things are. Uh, maybe you wish to explain more. I think, if I understand you correctly, well, we, we are extremely active at the, at the United Nations International Fora, of course, uh, and 
uh, in, as I mentioned, for the item four um, resolutions, probably um, a, a leading force in, in ensuring that the human rights voice more broadly, not just ours in particular, is, is being heard when egregious violations occur. Um, and I think we're also quite present around the world, not through our, our um, visibility in terms of you know talking the talk, but 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 more walking the walk. So, for me, you know, going to different parts of the world and visiting EU-funded projects in corners of the world you wouldn't even imagine to support children's education or women's rights or um, humanitarian aid in destitute people. Whether now it's, I mean, you know, two thirds of all the pledges on humanitarian aid for Syria refugees are European Union pledges today, for example, and the rest of the world is, is the one-third of it. I mean, in every instance that I can think of, you will see the European Union being there. To an extent that perhaps, and maybe that is a legitimate criticism that we face sometimes, and I, look, it doesn't please me always, to have to, to, to realize that, is, is that, you know, sometimes we, I mean, everyone, I mean, we're the big cow that everyone milks sometimes. You know, there's a lot of money that comes out of the EU. Give me money, give me money. And we do give money. We give a lot of money. We give more money than anyone else. But then we maybe don't insist as much as getting the recognition that comes from the fact that, uh, you know, that, that we are there. And, you know, is that good or bad? I don't know. I mean, sometimes it's bad. I mean, I certainly would like more recognition for a lot of the good things that we're doing around the world. On the other hand, I also want to give the ownership of human rights, as I said at the beginning, to people on the ground. So I don't want to be going there and saying, yes, this is a good thing, a good project. Uh, you know, praise me, please, the European Union, for having made it, made, made it happen. So, you know, will you be happy if I just say I'm schizophrenic about this? Is that OK? If I, I mean, I'm just a little schizophrenic. I don't know where I stand. Sometimes I want more publicity. Sometimes I, I, I want less. But, um, but your other point is, is, is a very good one. The, uh, the, on, the, uh, on the cultural um, uh, relativism issue. No, the vast majority of women that are being abused around the world are not women who will tell you, um, I'm happy with this, leave me alone, don't intervene. But yes, indeed, there are. I mean, if you were to take out, of course, the, the fundamental syndrome of women's abuse, which happens no matter what culture you're in, in some instances you're actually being abused and you go back for it, but that's a psychological issue and a big and a big one. If you were just to focus culturally, yes, there are some cultures that you need to do more work on this topic. I mentioned before female genital mutilation. This is a classic example. It is, in fact, why many women around the world tell us, ask us, not to call it female genital mutilation, but to call it female genital cutting. And when I first heard this, I said, come on, not one more you know, semantics dispute in the human rights world, you know, what, what the word is. The, the, but in fact, they're saying, look, it, the mothers, because it's mostly mothers who do this to their daughters around the world, don't do it out of a repression instinct. They do it out of love. They absolutely positively love their daughters and think that this is the right way to do it, to ensure that the daughters will be happy in their lives and accept in the communities, etc., etc. So if you're going to be approaching that woman and changing her, that mother, her understanding and mentality, you cannot be calling her a mutilator, which implies that she is actually doing it out of malice. You have to understand where she's coming from. And then you have to use human rights education, which is another major European Union priority around the world, and UN priority as well. Use human rights education, the correct human rights education, It's, it has to be the correct one, okay? I mean, human rights education doesn't mean anything in and of itself. It's very important. But of course, every major terrorist around the world today, or terrorist leader, if you were to look at it, are quite, is quite educated. So it's not just education. It's not just educating people. What does it mean to educate people effectively in different settings and different cultures to ensure that the human rights mentality, the tolerance mentality, takes root? So education is going to be very important there with, with, with those women as well which is also a human right, providing education. Um, yes, there, finally, there, or second finally, there are big expectations on human rights. They were created in the, mostly in the 90s. Wasn't it a wonderful time? I mean, the wall had fell, 
and everyone was feeling extremely joyous about the outbreak of democracy around the world and you know every country around the world was basically you know um, almost self evidently uh, accepting the notion that a bigger say of citizens bigger democracy big more human rights was the way to go you you are seeing now a backlash uh, of countries that um, that are feeling more powerful, more economically powerful, more geostrategically important, uh, who, however, have not moved adequately on the human rights path. And that is where the attacks on universality, civil society, uh, come on. But if I, were, if I understood you correctly, I think you said something a little, a little more complex. I think you almost criticized the fact that Everyone now does human rights in a sense, thinking that, you know, having been inspired by the fact that, the, you know, that human rights can be a big deal, and therefore you have people on the ground doing it that are not really qualified to do it in a sense. I understood you saying that there are people uh, doing surveys that they don't know how to do surveys. Sort of, I mean, it's, it's very important that there would be a grassroots ownership and, 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 and uh, sort of voice, but that sometimes some of the work that can be done can be creates major increased risk and re-traumatization of the victims but also it can create expectation that will then backlash into anger Absolutely. when those expectations yeah. are no, not no, met. No, I, 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 I fully understand. Yeah. I think that you will see us in our aid to civil society and others uh, placing a major emphasis on, on, on selecting a truly um, um, I don't want to say professional, but as, 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 as well-equipped organizations as we can, especially if we would support complex issues such as uh, peace building or, or addressing psychological and other, and, other, and, 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 and other effects, let's say, of human rights violations. Um, and at the same time, of course, uh, we, as you, as everyone, recognize the grassroots element of this and support everyone's ownership of human rights. So, uh, yes, when it comes down to determining which organization we will support on which particular topic, we always try to make sure, however, that uh, you know, they are best equipped to do it. And we train a lot. A lot of our engagement with civil society, with governments and others, is to train people to do it right. It doesn't grab headlines. It, you, know, you don't put out a press release saying that today I trained you know, 10 policemen somewhere. I mean, you know. Given what's happening in the world today, no one cares. But in fact, that's really the problem. Listen, that is a broader issue, by the way, given what's happening in the world. ISIS has raised the bar, haven't they? I mean, de decapitating people on YouTube and all that stuff. It's like, you know, after you've seen that, then if I were to tell you that in so-so country there are 20,000 people in jail that shouldn't be in jail, you tell me, come on, where's the decapitation? Why should I care? I have so many problems. I'm trying to get some bread on the table my family. You know, we have financial crisis in Europe now, these asylum people come in, come on. I mean, public opinion is in danger of losing its interest in human rights in the way, because also, because also sometimes the stories are too negative. I mean, in the 90s, it was a positive story. Now you hear about challenges, about issues. And if the people lose their interest, there's a danger that but politicians will lose their interest because it doesn't get enough votes anymore. It is extremely important, as I said at the beginning, in this climate that we double our efforts to stick by our values guns, as it were. This is a values battle as, a, as much as anything else. And, and understand where we came from and where we're going and why this is not soft politics, not an afterthought. If you don't do human rights, you're bound to have war, you're bound to have destitution, you're bound to have social instability, you're bound to have economic deprivation. You are bound to have those things. And anyone who tells you that, no, that's not true, look at me, I violate everyone's rights and yet my economy grows a little bit, they don't know what they're talking about. And I think they're beginning, some of them, to understand they don't know what they're talking about, which is why maybe, maybe one would hope they would move more positively on human rights. Um, yeah, okay. Um, I... We'll take one last question, um, and I saw Tom McCarthy before, uh, so he gets the last Thank question. Thank you very much. Um, he, my name is Tom McCarthy, and um, I'm a uh, former UN staff member, and I had the pleasure of working with uh, Andrew on a project about 
economic, social, and cultural rights and violence. And I want to thank you for an extraordinarily uh, good presentation. But the project we worked on saw that there were economic development projects, and I think supported by the EU, which within the economic terms were acceptable. Growth, this and that. But the impact on human rights was so negative that it undermined the whole, the whole social system and led to quite a bit of violence. And there's, there's some good publications that we did under the guidance of, of, of uh, Andrew. Now, when the EU looks at just economic development, does it raise the issues of human rights? Are the people consulted? What about... What about evacuations? In, 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 uh, because that's a, that's a really difficult question. Um, do you have a, a way of reviewing your projects so that they contribute to human rights in addition to the money that you spend on very wealthy, w w well thought out and positive things to produce human rights? Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to make that the last question because the format of these sessions is that it's uh, one... Uh, we're going to have one very last question, indeed. Sorry. Thank you, sir, for allowing me to ask uh, uh, this question. I'm Setareki uh, Matanoi from Fiji, and following the 31st session of the Human Rights uh, uh, Council and I must also apologize for coming in late. Um, the, the, the special representative on human rights of the uh, European Union, um, we, we strongly encourage officers uh, to work closely with uh, the European Disability Forum when it comes to matters concerning personal disabilities uh, in, in Europe. And I, I want to follow up with two uh, questions. Um, and, and also and acknowledging that uh, the European Union is the first uh, 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 regional uh, intergovernmental inter organization uh, that, that ratified the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, so congratulations. Um, the question relating to that is, uh, there, there's a, a, a question raised uh, when uh, the European Union uh, uh, was questioned by the, the CRPD committee on your, um, uh, the adoption of a gender equality strategy. I'd just like to uh, know uh, if uh, your office uh, is involved in that and the update on that one. Uh, the second question relating to where I come from in the Pacific, uh, where there's an opportunity for your office uh, working closely with uh, 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 regional organizations like, in our case, the Pacific Violence Forum Secretariat, uh, to share sharing good, uh, good practice and, and, and also uh, uh, sharing some of uh, um, the work that you do around human rights and uh, share the, the, those with other re regional inter intergovernmental organizations like ASEAN, Special Foreign Secretariat, African Union, uh, particularly on the issue of disability, which is our interest this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you're absolutely right to point to that, uh, to that issue. We have identified it, thankfully, uh, a few years back, the, the issue of absolutely needing to have a human rights-based approach to development. And we now have it. Uh, it is uh, nascent. Uh, we have a toolkit for making development aid decisions based on human rights. It involves <coughs> human rights impact assessments before a development aid project is approved. And it also goes to our trade agreements when we cite trade or investment agreements. Uh, it involves um, consulting with civil society on the ground before a decision for a project is made. And it also does involve, but it hasn't been tried yet. I mean, we're doing it over the years. We have tried to, some times more successfully than others. But now, officially, we also have to have a, 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 an impact assessment following a particular development project. Uh, indeed, I mean, the, uh, I, I don't know what examples you had in your studies. Uh, I'd like to see them, by the way. I haven't, uh, uh, but the, um, I, mean, I, had, I had an experience in one of my visits myself. I went to, uh, to a country um, a couple of years ago, and they took me to an EU-funded hospital. 
uh, in the capital. And it was, uh, it was actually quite impressive, I have to say. I mean, I was, I was, uh, I, I mean, I, I was, I felt proud. And then someone as I was leaving took me aside from the country and said, you know what, thank you for the hostel, but you know what they won't tell you is that unfortunately it's so good and therefore so expensive that no one can come to it except for the rich people in the country. So we have a lot of poor people, especially from outside the capital, who just cannot get that care. So great hospital. That's an example of a very good project that didn't take into account the human rights implications, let's say, of it. Because in fact, sharing health, especially to those most in need of it, is, is part of a human rights obligation. It's not just giving health, it's where does it go. So, let us hope that this new strategy that we have, that the European Commission is running, the European Commission is, um, has a special commissioner dealing with development aid around the world, uh, will be one that will bear some fruit. Sometimes, you know, it's very difficult to measure human rights effects of a particular EU intervention. Sometimes it's not, it may be very obvious, the connection, but other times it's not. I mean, is, is, is my issuing identity cards for women to vote in a particular country the reason why more women voted? Or is it that they had education programs funded by the UN 10 years ago that have reached a point, a critical mass of women voting more? Or is it that, you know, there was this big project, economic one, and women found work and became more empowered and spoke to each other. It's a little difficult to be able to say, my project did this, but, it, but we're trying to find the right way. And I know there's a lot of literature as well out there that tries to give you ideas on how to do it. Keep in mind that the new action plan on human rights and democracy in the EU, I didn't get into those boring things, but you know, boring to a general audience. We have an action plan. That means that everyone in the European Union, 28 member states, all the institutions, got together and said, when we say we want to do human rights in our foreign policy, that means that we will set specific goals, what do we want to achieve on different rights, specific dates by which we have to try to achieve them, and then we're going to have a debate at the European Parliament to see what we did right and what we did wrong. The action plan that we adopted, just adopted last, the second one on human rights and democracy, adopted last July, is going through its first year of implementation and includes explicitly a number of references to the importance of greater mainstreaming of human rights and development in trade and in, in, on all these issues. Um, now, the Small Islands Forum, of course, and, and uh, thank you for, for, for bringing this up. Uh, absolutely in touch with it, absolutely. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, both at the uh, UN level of discussions, but also separately, um, interactions on seeing whether or not there are human rights challenges that we can work on together. Now, it is among my priorities for this next year to also try to have a visit and meet with uh, the Secretary General, the Secretariat and others to see whether or not we can identify more clear, specific things we can do together to be concrete and not just general. On disabilities, I think it might be a, 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 an, an excellent opportunity precisely because the European Union, as European Union, is now a, a, a signatory of the convention. Uh, but I would be more than willing to get more advice uh, on specific human rights issues uh, not just in Fiji, but elsewhere, that in the region that you think the EU should be focusing more on. Um, now, dear Professor Clayham and any, everyone here in the, in the room, I am um, very grateful uh, for this opportunity. Uh, it doesn't happen often that I have the chance to just sit down. I often listen to my voice, <laughs> mind you, but not listening to others and having the chance of a relatively relaxed, we could use much more time. Indeed. Uh, I have to go now back because there's a major anti-torture event uh, that is being organized. Uh, speaking of the cross-regional by Denmark, 
by Morocco, by Indonesia. So there's an effort in the United Nations level to take this huge problem, torture, and to bring it to a cross-regional debate and awareness. Uh, and I have, to, and I have to, um, uh, to give the keynote speech there. Um, may I say that if I'm back, I would love to come back and continue this conversation. Um, I will try to give you a different speech next time. Uh, so so don't, don't you worry. Thank but, you. I'm uh, sure we'll take you up on that. It would, um, be, it would be wonderful. Maybe on the things that you're working on, which is, which is so important, what is the private individual's responsibility to promote human rights versus a government, a state? And how do we, does this translate on everything from business to human rights to anti-terrorism to all those things? That is a major, big, uh, and fascinating topic. And, and your professor here is, as you, uh, as you probably know, uh, and should be proud of, one of, the, one of the leading voices in the world on this topic. I think I'm going to have to cut you short now. It's getting embarrassing. Um, please join me in thanking the special representative.